We begin with some tragic news reaching us about another boat tragedy off the North African coast. As many as 12 migrants are feared to have drowned after their boat capsized near the Egyptian port city of Alexandria. According to security officials, more than 100 people from the ill-fitted boat have been rescued. The survivors are reportedly said to be mainly Palestinians and Syrians. They were taken to a naval base. We'll give you more details in our subsequent updates. Now to Ethiopia, where African leaders are meeting in the capital, Addis Ababa, to discuss a potential withdrawal from the International Criminal Court. The two-day summit has been prompted by the looming trial of Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, at the Hague-based court. Already, there's been strong criticism of the ICC. One top official says the court is a political instrument targeting Africans. CCTV's Groom Chala has more. The opening ceremony of what could be a historical summit for the African Union more than 30 countries are represented in Addis this weekend amid concerns that the International Criminal Court is biased. It denies those allegations, but many here are not convinced. The manner in which the court has been operating, particularly its unfair treatment of Africa and African Africans, leaves much to be desired. Far from promoting justice and reconciliation, and contributing to the advancement of peace and stability in our continent, the court has transformed itself into a political instrument targeting Africa and Africans. The trigger for this summit is the impending trial of Uhuru Kenyatta. Kenya's president is charged alongside his deputy, William Ruto, with orchestrating the violence that followed Kenya's 2007 elections. The African Union wants the ICC to make allowance for their leadership duties. But it's not just the Kenyan case that has disturbed the African Union. Officials here have long opposed the ICC arrest warrant for Sudanese leader Omar al-Bashir. And they're upset too that the United Nations has not stepped in. It's regrettable that our repeated call has fallen on deaf, deaf ears and our concerns have been completely ignored particularly our request to the United Nations Security Council to defer the proceedings initiated against President al-Bashir has neither been heard nor acted upon. These foreign ministers on Friday were drafting an agenda for their heads of state to discuss on Saturday. They are opening for a decision on the International Criminal Court before the summit ends. For all the harsh words here, analysts predict there will not be a general withdrawal. They say it's far more likely the summit will draw up a plan to renegotiate Africa's engagement with the court. Grumjala CCTV at the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa. As the AU summit commences, delegates will do much of the hard talk behind closed doors. But among those we spoke to, the general feeling is that relations with the ICC cannot stay as they are. Most of us here are looking for respect for Africa in the exercise of justice. What, what for the numerous victims in the African continent? Victims, what justice for them? Victims deserve justice. It's the way justice is exercised that we're discussing. There's a lot of support. There is no time at all that we have said that we want to move out of the ICC. We've never said that. Right? Are we concerned about uh, you know, uh, some of the things that are happening in the court? Yes, we are. But we have never said we would move out. We are a state party. We intend to remain a state party. We need to have some changes made, and we will um, make those requests at the appropriate forum, which is the Assembly of State Parties. We wanted the ICC also that would be responsive to the needs of our people, whether our people are mistreated by their own leaders or by international corporations that uh, take our wealth and condemn our people to uh, a very d dire condition. All right, let's discuss this issue further. We are now joined by CCTV's Beatrice, Beatrice Marshall, live from Addis Ababa. Beatrice?
Well, Penina, thank you very much indeed. It has been a long day here for the Executive Council, who are the foreign ministers of Africa here at the, uh, at the African Union. They have been meeting since 9 a.m. They have just taken a, sh a break a short while ago. They will be returning again at 9 p.m. Uh, Ethiopian time, East African time, to further discuss the issues they have been debating during the day. Now, they three issues here on the agenda as of this moment. One of them will be seeking further immunities or complete immunities for sitting African heads of states from uh, prosecution at the International Criminal Court. They will also be asking for a reforming of the ICC as well as seeking deferrals or referrals and taking their case before the UN Security Council. Now they are saying that Africa has to speak and say it is enough from the ICC and they want respect but will they be getting that respect at the, from the ICC and what exactly are the positions being taken by the various leaders here at the African Union. Well, let's get more now from Dr. David Matsanga, who's been following events here. He's an African a political analyst and he's here uh, at the African Union. Now, what is the expectations here at the African Union from the summit tomorrow? First of all, uh, we, the African uh, heads of state expect to receive some form of uh, some form of package from the ICC. What is the cooperation? It has cooperated. They have taken their people, but the ICC has not reformed. That is one of the main agenda in May, which they have begun on. Secondly, the question of sitting presidents, heads of states, being taken to the Hague, is what they are trying to discuss to make sure that in the future, some of these things don't happen. If it is a, a sitting president, you have to wait until the term is over, and then you can come. But let me come back to the reality. The reality is that we did not expect that every country from Africa will come here and jump. They must be explained to what is the situation. The worrying situation on the Kenyan scenario is that most of the evidence in the Kenyan cases were shoddy, we are not well collected, and that is why the whole of Africa is not very pleased with the ICC's collection of if evidence, and that is why they are seeking reforms, which should actually... They are not saying ICC is bad, but they are saying, why is it that a court, their complaints, why doesn't the court come and put a panel to investigate about these complaints? David, let me just ask you this, though. Uh, there was a perception that Africa was going to be seeking a pullout, uh, a, a joint pullout for the continent from the ICC. But then it seems now that African countries are talking about reforming the ICC, talking about immunities for heads of state. Is there a softening of positions being taken here now? I think the positions are not softening. The position is not softening. Only that it is changing and they want something from the ICC. What is it that they want to get? What can ICC do now to reform its OTP? That is what the people are, are saying. They are not saying that we, we, we hold somebody, walk out. Another thing that I have seen which is coming out is that a riot act, they are reading a, a riot act to the ICC. I think from tomorrow they, met, they will make a resolution, take it to the Security Council. Kenya is in a problem, a problem of security and security which is actually running around Kenya. Therefore, 12 month suspension pending a renewal, a review of the 12 months could make, put Kenya back to a, a place where insecurity does not prevail. At the moment, all regional countries, African countries are seeing that if Kenya looks at ICC issues only, forgets the backyard of insecurity, the, the terrorists will crop in. And the people will die. That's why African countries are concerned about ICC and its involvement, intervention into Kenyan cases and the intervention into other African cases. All right, uh, Dr. David Matsanga there joining us uh, on that situation of the International Criminal Court. Well, the heads of state will be arriving here tomorrow. Many of them have begun arriving here this evening and uh, there is expectation that there will be over 30 heads of state to discuss uh, that relationship between Africa and the International Criminal Court. Penina? All right, Beatrice, some interesting developments there indeed. I will be keeping tabs with you throughout this weekend so we can get 
get the latest from Addis Ababa. Peter's Marshall live there from the AU headquarters. Now, a proposal for African countries to pull out of the ICC seems to be gaining currency uh, here. Some Africans feel the Hague-based tribunal is biased against the continent, which has the bulk of cases there, yet there are other cases of crimes against humanity being perpetrated elsewhere. The general feeling among some Africans is that the continent should come up with its own court to try African cases. Now we have Kenya, the president of Kenya, the vice, they are uh, being tried at uh, The Hague. You have uh, uh, Al-Bashir who refused to go there but uh, had been uh, indicted. And you, you have quite a number of, of these African leaders who have been called to the ICC. Uh, you, you don't know as African that uh, is it because African leaders have ideologies that are different from the West Maybe that's the problem. That's why they are being uh, called to the to the Hague to be tried there. I think that the ICC stands for a good cause, and that's to bring justice to all people, regardless of race, regardless of where you come from. I don't think Africa should pull out of the ICC. I think that lately the attention has been on African leaders lately. But that's not to say that the ICC is targeting Africans or that there's some kind of prejudice on African leaders or African people, but that we need to understand that some of the crimes that have been committed in many of our countries, many of our African countries, were not justifiable. It's a good move if all African countries pull out of the ICC because we've never seen any European leader or any leaders from the Western countries being tried at the ICC. It's all African leaders and I think it's high time we should pull out and stand up against these people who are always trying to oppress us. Separately, the International Criminal Court has ruled that Libya can try the former intelligence chief of ousted leader Muammar Gaddafi. ICC had previously demanded he be handed over to the Hague. But because Abdallah al Sanusi is already being tried in Libya, ICC judges court concluded that the case is inadmissible before the court in accordance with the principle of complementarity. End quote. The court said on Friday that pretrial judges ruled Libyan authorities have the capacity to prosecute the former spy chief for alleged crimes against humanity over the murder and persecution of protesters in the early days of the uprising that eventually toppled Gaddafi in 2011. The ICC, however, stressed that the Senussi decision had no bearing on the case against Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, who is still wanted in The Hague. Both men are being held in Libya. Under international law, a country has the first right and obligation to try suspected war crimes cases at home. The former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, will serve his prison sentence in the United Kingdom. The 65-year-old was handed a 50-year sentence for aiding and abating war crimes. Charles Taylor's trial was held in The Hague. We now cross over to our UK correspondent Natalie Fiery to find out more about the decision for Charles Taylor to serve his sentence in a UK jail. Well, other possible options had included Rwanda, Finland and Sweden. But Jeremy Wright, the Minister for Justice, confirmed that it is here in the UK where Charles Taylor will serve his prison sentence. Now, it was back in 2007 that Parliament passed an act to ensure that if convicted, he could be imprisoned here in the UK and the cost would be absorbed by the British government. The Justice Minister said that this had been essential for him to be able to stand trial in The Hague at the special court for Sierra Leone. Now, it's not confirmed yet in which prison Charles Taylor will serve his sentence, but it is believed to be likely that this will start off in Belmarsh Prison in the south of London. It's a high security prison because Charles Taylor is believed to have a network of supporters which could try to help him escape but he won't be kept in solitary confinement because it is not likely that he will face attack by other prisoners. Now, Jeremy Wright, the Minister for Justice, said that this was a landmark moment for international justice and that it sent a strong signal to others who have committed atrocities and war crimes that whatever their positions, they would face justice. Now, this is the first time a former head of state has been convicted uh, at an international court for committing war crimes since the Second World War. Well, that's Natalie Fieri there in London. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a break coming up.
nobody will be arrested just based on rumor or smear campaign. But I will also not protect anybody. Malawian president talks tough on corruption as she sends the entire cabinet home. The Lampedusa boat tragedy claimed over 200 lives off the coast of Italy. Every year, thousands of Africans try to cross the Mediterranean to Europe in makeshift boats. Many never make it. Find out why this week in Talk Africa. A bomb exploded outside the Swedish consulate in the eastern Libyan city of Benghazi on Friday. The front of the building and nearby houses were damaged, but no casualties were immediately reported. The Swedish foreign minister said none of its staff had been injured because the consulate is closed on Fridays. The attack comes a day after Libya's prime minister, Ali Zaidan, was briefly abducted by a group of former rebels. Nobody claimed responsibility for that attack. Libya is struggling to regain stability after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi. Its central government and nascent army are struggling to control rival militias and Islamist militants. Malawi's president Joyce Banda dissolved her entire cabinet on Thursday in response to a multi-million dollar fraud scandal. Police said around 10 junior government officials had been arrested and they had recovered tens of thousands of dollars in cash in their car boots and homes. One senior government official said Banda told the cabinet she had lost faith in them. The multi-million dollar cash gate scandal, as it's locally known, forced the government to shut down its payment system last week to investigate more than four million US dollars that went missing. The presidency said Banda, who came to office in April last year, would announce a new cabinet in due course. While speaking on Wednesday, Banda acknowledged the corruption that continues to dog the country and said those responsible would feel the full force of the law. It is obvious that huge amounts of public funds have been lost through corruption and theft within the public service and uh, regrettably this will still continue. I wish to call upon the nation not to panic. We have a very able and professional police service and so nobody will be arrested just based on rumor or smear campaign. But I will also not protect anybody. In other news across the continent, a warlord who had claimed to be in military command of Bangasu in Central African Republic has been arrested alongside 30 of his men. Colonel Abdallah, formerly of the Seleka Rebel Coalition, and his men are accused of spreading terror across the eastern CAR city. They have been transferred to the capital, Bangui, where they will be detained. Separately, at least 60 people were killed in sectarian clashes in the CAR between local militias and former rebels. The new transitional government's failure to stem the violence has prompted the UN Security Council to pass a resolution paving the way for peacekeepers to be sent to the country. Elsewhere, Morocco's King Mohammed VI has appointed a new Islamist-led government, ending a month-long crisis triggered by a defection of a key coalition partner. The cabinet shake-up sees Saad Eddin El Othman replaced as foreign minister by Salahuddin Mazur, who heads the national rally of independence and whose agreement to join the government effectively prevented it from collapsing. Six women also take cabinet posts compared with just one in the previous administration. Abdelila Benkirane remains Prime Minister. Ben Kirani's party has headed the government since triumphing in 2011 elections, which followed the popular Arab revolts in the region. And finally, a team of South African researchers have discovered the first evidence of a comet hitting Earth. Following a series of analysis, researchers determined that a mysterious black pebble discovered years ago in the Egyptian desert is a piece of comet nucleus, the first ever discovered. The pebble, named Hypatia in honor of the ancient female mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher Hypatia of Alexandria, is also studded with diamonds, which the scientists say makes sense considering its cometary origin. The impact is calculated to have occurred about 28 million years ago over in Egypt. Well, let's take another break here on Africa Live. Straight ahead. Going green, we tell you about one exceptional hotel in Cape Town, South Africa.
South Africa now and the city of Cape Town has embarked on several ventures to cut its carbon footprint. But one hotel is leading the way. The Hotel Bud is being hailed as a marvel in sustainable living and its guests are in for a few surprises. CCTV's Travis Andrews has more. Airports are often associated with heavy carbon emissions. Yet less than 400 meters from Cape Town's busy airport is what's claimed to be Africa's greenest hotel. From the outside, there may be few clues. Step inside, though, and it's a different story. The walls are alive with indigenous plants, as well as alien wood from a deforestation project. Wind turbines keep the lights on, and should you fancy a quick workout in the gym, this equipment feeds your expended energy directly into the power supply. From the minute this hotel was actually built, um, everything was planned to make it a green, sustainable hotel. The way the world's going at the moment, the only way that one can do is to work sustainably and to make sure that you have those measures in place. We have electricity that is going up, our resources are running out, and hence the, the decision to go sustainably and self-sufficient as far as possible. The hotel food is drawn from an aquaponic system, a sustainable system that combines a mini fish farm with vegetable production. The hotel is not just a lesson in green living, but a lesson in green building. We've implemented a host of sustainability initiatives, energy efficiency, water efficiency, waste reduction, the right materials, recycle content, rapidly renewable content. So basically what we've built here is a, is a flagship, a benchmark, if you will. And our belief and our hope is that the industry will follow suit at least to some degree. And the price of going green in a Cape Town hotel, around $100 a night for a double room, roughly on par with the city's more traditional hotels. This hotel's move to a greener future isn't over yet. There's also plans underway to revive this wetlands behind me and try and lure back indigenous wildlife who once lived here. Travis Andrews, CCTV, Cape Town. Natural hair is making a comeback in Senegal. The recent Afro Dakar meeting offered a platform for women turning their backs on chemical straightening and discuss all things hair. And their cause is gaining momentum. Clementine Logan has more. Finding salons that cater for natural hair isn't easy. Meetings like this one offer women a place to share hair care tips. The chemicals that Kumba Lay previously used to straighten her hair almost destroyed it. But she admits natural hair care isn't easy either. It's not for everyone. You have to really want it like everything in this world because it requires care. Agnes Dioff is one of the organizers behind Afro Dakar, an organization entirely dedicated to bringing natural hair back. It's a mix of natural and happy. Natural hair is not a disaster and people don't have to know how to comb it or take care of it. And I'd say for Senegal, the best definition is natural and happy. For many here, there's also a deeper link between a woman's pride in herself and having natural hair. I prefer natural hair now because I think it's more me than when I had straightened my hair. Before, smooth hair was considered the model of beauty. But after when I decided to really stop straightening my hair and to let it grow naturally, I saw another me, another Maguette. Bloggers like Mary Grace Agboton are helping women learn how to care for their afros. She says the comeback of natural hair is symbolic. It's becoming a return of honor to the African woman. Many no longer feel obligated to have smooth hair in order to feel beautiful. We can have our hair and walk proudly down the street. While straightened hair still remains the norm in Senegal, these women hope that with a little encouragement and advice, more will go oh so natural. Clementine Logan, CCTV. And a more upbeat story out of Egypt now. Moviegoers are massing in Alexandria for the city's international film festival. Organizers are determined that despite security worries, the show will go on. CCTV's Adel Mahri reports. With the Mediterranean Sea and a little music as a backdrop, Alexandria launches its 29th film festival. 
Around 140 films have been entered for the festival. 27 European and Arabic countries are represented here. That's fewer than the usual. A reflection of Egypt's political turmoil. But Alexandria's governor says there is more to the festival than movies. We must add the light at the end of the tunnel, and so we did. And Egypt needs this light, because if we didn't hold this festival, we will always be afraid. To guarantee safety, the opening ceremony was held in a naval base, and guests are staying in a hotel owned by the armed forces. Egypt is not alone in going through difficult times. Several Arab countries are. And this is reflected in some of the movies. We want to support Egypt in these hard times. The Arab world and even the whole world is becoming violent. Today I saw two movies, both very violent. It seems to me that this is and will be the trend for some time. I'm so happy we could make the film at the first place and it's a combination of the three stories for three women from three different times uh, in Syria and there's like a kind of uh, a line between these three st stories but at the end you can see uh, three different uh, crises uh, had been passed on Syria. To some the festival significance outweighs any risks. It's my first time in this festival and Unfortunately, it's the, the, the only festival in the Arabic uh, countries because uh, there is no Cairo Film Festival, there is no Damascus Film Festival, and so. And that's, uh, for me, it's, uh, it is very important to see the Arabic movies because it's uh, maybe the, the only occasion. Not everyone, though is impressed. The attendance of artists was much weaker than usual. The organization lacks many things, but they had to hold it at this timing. Egypt's coastal city, Alexandria, defied all security challenges and successfully launched the Mediterranean Film Festival. It doesn't care how big the festival is this year, as long as the message is clear that life in Egypt will go on. Adel Mahroui, CCTV, Alexandria. All right, let's catch up now with the latest on biz news. Rama joins us for that.